his messages because they always challenge me and he always, he always encourages me, he always speaks to me in his message. Uh, this past Sunday, actually, he uh, was talking about how uh, he really, I think it was Sunday, uh, he talked about how he really struggled with movies that left him hanging. Were you guys here for that? Talked about movies that didn't bring closure to it. And, and I get that, I, I get that, but it really got me to thinking tonight about movies and, and I love movies. Anybody else like movies? You know, the best way to, to, to do movies is, is probably at the movies. And so tonight we're going to talk about the big picture. I love going to the movies. My family likes going to the movies, but I got to be honest, one of my favorite parts of the movie experience is, you guessed it, the popcorn. No question. It is that buttery, tasty movie popcorn. And maybe when you came in tonight, you, you got the aroma, right? Some of you thought, man, we must be at the movie house church or something. If you're a first timer with us tonight, we don't always serve popcorn on Wednesdays. It's just when they let the crazy guy speak, he has some crazy ideas. But if you're online and not with us, then you miss the popcorn, but pop yourself a bag at home and enjoy it. I love movie popcorn so much so that I want to see if I'm alone in this. My wife actually loves movie popcorn more than I do, her and Julia. And sometimes they just want some movie popcorn. And so I have to go to the movies, buy popcorn, and bring it home. Has anybody else ever done that, or is that, am I alone in that? Nobody else? The rest of you are like, we've done it, but we're not admitting it for sure. We like movie popcorn a lot. Pastor Kendall, do you know what is worse than a movie that leaves you hanging? Not seeing the ending of the movie is worse than a movie that leaves you hanging. Anybody ever miss the ending of a movie? Now, if you know me as the recovery ministries pastor, I'm open, honest, and transparent. I just lay all my junk out there for you. And I'm gonna be honest, I have missed some movie endings because I slept through them, all right? I'll be real honest tonight. After the popcorn, even at the movie theater, I have fell asleep in the movie house. Anybody else just confession time tonight? I see that hand, I see that hand. My wife is pretty well known around our house for sleeping during movies. We'll say, hey, we're gonna start a movie and we're like, mom's gonna miss it anyway. I'll tell you who's the worst though, Vanessa Valencia. She's hiding over there. If you start a movie with the Valencias, it's a guarantee before the rolling credits are done and introduction are done, Vanessa's out cold. She's missing sometimes the best part of the movie. I remember when Batman came out years ago, like the original Batman, a long time ago, uh, there was a tornado. We're sitting in the movie house and the tornado comes and they, they shut it down. We had to leave and I missed the ending of Batman. I don't know what happened, you know? Not too long ago, a movie we were highly anticipating seeing, Avengers Endgame came out. We were waiting for the Endgame. This was the movie to end it all. We were gonna see how the universe survived. We get to the movie house, get almost to the ending of Endgame, and the movie stops working. I mean, literally, a theater full of people are like, what? There was popcorn being thrown, and we got a refund, but we missed the ending. And, and the truth is, it was pretty disappointing. See, when we miss the big picture, when we miss, I would say, even the best part, it's disappointing. But the truth is, I think in our lives, all too often, not just the movies, but in our lives, we are missing the big picture. I think many of us are missing the best part. I think there's a lot of reasons we are. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I think sometimes, going back to the movie theme, we just can't see clearly. I know I'm picking on Vanessa Valencia again, but we went and seen a movie with, with the Valencias a couple of weeks ago, and it was a 3D movie, right? If you're going to go to the movies, you get popcorn, you get the glasses, you get the whole experience. Vanessa began to say, I really don't like these glasses. I don't like wearing them. I, can't, I, don't like the way they, I don't like the way things look. But guess what Vanessa had to do if she was going to get the full experience? She had to wear the glasses. And sometimes in order to get the full experience of what God is doing, we have to be able to see clearly. We have to be able to do things we may not even want. We have to be able to do things we may not even be comfortable with. And I want you tonight to experience all God has for you in your life. 
I want you to see the big picture of what God is doing in your, in your spiritual relationship with him, in your family, in your finances, in your health. I want you to see what I would say, not even the, just the big picture, but maybe even the best part. Because there certainly are things that cause us to miss those. I want to read you a story in scripture that I know we're not always familiar with. There's a guy named Eutychus. Anyone know who Eutychus is in scripture? Some, anybody not know who Eutychus is? Confession time. It's okay if you don't know who Eutychus is. A really small part, but a really big message. In the middle of Acts chapter 20, in the middle of, of all that was going on in the book of Acts and all the miracles and the move of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 20 verse 7 tells us this, that on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking till midnight. This is an old school church here, all right? Some of you have been around. Y'all remember going to revivals that lasted till midnight, right? He was a little kid drooling on the back row. Paul was speaking until midnight. And verse number eight says, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who kept sleeping or who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, it says, some of you wonder why I brought popcorn tonight? Because as I talk on and on, I don't want anybody to fall asleep, all right? Enjoy your popcorn, stay awake. The best part's coming. Eutychus, as Paul was preaching on and on, long-winded Paul, Eutychus, the Bible tells us, fell into a sleep. And verse number nine says, when he was sound asleep, remember, seated in this upstairs window, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. He died. Died in the church. What an incredible thing. Now, my little hometown where I'm from, a little small church in, in southern Oklahoma, I, I got some confession tonight. We had two people die in our church, man. Our pastor was really long-winded too. My great-grandmother actually passed away in our church. I, I, I remember that. And then we had another elderly gentleman passed away in our church. Some of you are like, man, I don't know if I want to go to church if this is what's happened. Eutychus fell sound asleep, fell from the third story window, fell and hit the ground and was dead. And verse number 10 says, Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him and said, don't be alarmed for he is alive. Then he went upstairs again, broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, all right, somebody passed out, fell asleep because you were so long. Somebody died and you're just going right back at it, right? We got something to say kept talking until daylight, then he left. And the, the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. And this is all scripture tells us about Eutychus. All we know about Eutychus was he fell asleep in a sermon, died, and God resurrected him. But the truth is, that's quite a story. It's certainly a miracle, and there's some valuable things to be drawn from that. If you die tonight and fall asleep, Pastor Kyle's gonna throw himself on you, pray for you, and you're gonna live. I believe it. Certainly, it's a miracle. But I want to really delve into why Eutychus was in the position where he would fall from a third-story window and die. Was, was Eutychus perhaps just really tired? It was, after all, almost midnight. Paul was going on and on. It was a long service. It was getting late. There's no question he was probably tired. But I want to say tonight that perhaps Eutychus had some other problems. Perhaps he had some other things that were causing him to miss the big picture, causing him to miss even the best part. Tonight, I want to tell you three things that I think we all have to overcome so we don't miss what God is doing, so we don't miss the big picture. And I'm going to use three separate movies tonight to hopefully help you understand this point. The first thing that I think we have to ask or we have to maybe question, or the first thing I think hinders us from seeing what God is doing is performance. When we're trying to perform. So I want to ask you this tonight. Was Eutychus in that window, the third story window up high? Was he just there to be seen? Was it possible that Eutychus just wanted everybody to see him? Was it possible that he was sitting in that window, maybe because there was no other seats or maybe because he just wanted to be seen? Remember this first movie, still one of my favorites. It's, it's called The Greatest Showman. I want to talk about The Greatest Showman for a, a moment. The Greatest Showman is such a, a great movie. Sabrina was talking just last week. She goes, we need to watch The Greatest Showman again. 
I love the greatest showman. I love the, 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 the songs of it. I love the, the theatrical experience of it. If you're not familiar with it, it is a movie about P.T. Barnum and the circus. And much of what it was, was, was this showman, this person who put on a show. Much of it was when you realize it wasn't real. It was, it was not just fantasized. It was almost fake. What P.T. Barnum did was, was put on a great show. What he did was use trickery and and ways to, to convince people of things that might not be true. And he was really good at it. And I think sometimes the reason you and I miss what God is doing, because perhaps like Eutychus up there to be seen, perhaps like P.T. Barnum himself, we are just putting on a show. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, brutal, not lovers of good, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then verse number five says this, they will have a form of godliness, but deny the power that is in it. I wonder today in our churches, how many people have a form of godliness, but no power? I wonder today how many people are putting on the show. I wonder how many people are coming to church and putting on their church face and just performing, just doing it to be seen. Isaiah 29, 13 says, the Lord says this, these people come near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they've been taught. I wonder if we miss the big picture because we're too busy putting on a show, too busy performing, too busy trying to obey the rules of what worship is, of what church is. The greatest showman. Four and a half years ago, I, I know exactly what it is to put on a performance. As a pastor, after all, there's, there's a level of that performance that, that we want to have, and there's a level of that performance that is necessary. But if we're not careful, it all becomes performance. And in my ministry five years ago, it was all about me. It was all about the show. <laughs> pastor L.A. asked me tonight, he said, he was talking about how we we're going to end the sermon, you know, with an altar call or something. And he asked me, he said, hey, how are you going to land this plane tonight? And I said, well, it depends on how long I stay in the air. And the truth is, I can stay in the air. Like Paul, we can go all night. Especially if it becomes about me. I could put on a show. Five years ago, my ministry was a show. It was a performance. Uh, it wasn't all fake. It wasn't that I was just like a televangelist there asking for money and doing fake miracles. No, no, it was more about me doing the rules of what worship was supposed to be, the rules of what it was supposed to be and, not, and missing the heart of it. I had a form of godliness, but missed the power of it. And we say, oh, that's not me, that's not me. We come every Sunday and pretend that everything's perfect. And let's be honest tonight, we know it's not. We hear the altar calls and, and we want to come, but we decide not to because we're afraid who might see. You know what that is? That's performance. That's putting on the church makeup and, and filling the, the part. And that's the greatest showman is what that is. And we miss the big picture of what God is doing in our lives. We miss the best part if we're not careful. Second question I would ask tonight that maybe Eutychus struggled with, maybe it wasn't performance, maybe he wasn't up there to be seen, maybe he wasn't just putting on a show saying, hey, look at me, look at me. But I know many people struggle with this. Maybe Eutychus had an issue with pride. My question would be this, was Eutychus in that window because he didn't think he needed to be down there with the other people? Was Eutychus seated high up there because perhaps he didn't think he needed what was going on down there among the common folks, among the regular folks. He didn't need what was going on in that room. He was good. He was sad. Maybe Eutychus was just a loner. Maybe he was up in that window because he wasn't really a people person, all right? I don't really like people. Listen, I don't like people all the time either, all right? That's not a bad thing. I like all of you. It's other people I don't like. It is okay not to like people because guess what? Some days I don't like me. It's okay. But God did not create us to live alone in solitude and isolation. God created us to live in unity. And if we have the love of God in us, guess what? We're going to love people too. 
Perhaps Eutychus is in that window because he thought he was just better than everybody else. Perhaps he was up there because he thought he didn't need anyone else. Reminds me of one of the all-time great movies, Top Gun, right? Anybody like Top Gun? Or how about this, Top Gun Maverick? Man, we waited a long time to see if Tom Cruise could still fly that plane. We waited to see the sequel. We went and saw the sequel in my family. I stayed awake for it. And here's what I realized. Tom Cruise, Maverick, was just as arrogant in the sequel as he was in the first one. He had just as much problem with pride as he did in the very first movie. In Top yeah, even more so. In Top Gun, it's about a guy who's, who's out there doing it on his own, doing it his way, doing flybys, breaking the rules. The rules don't apply to him. There's a pride issue going on there. And if you remember, it cost him his best friend's life. It cost him his co-pilot's life. And pride will cost us something. Pride will cost us to see the big picture of what God is doing. Pride will cost us to see the best part of what God is doing. Philippians 2, 3, and 8 says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. You see, it's not about why Eutychus was up in the window. It's about why he wasn't down with the people. Value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset of Christ, who being very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used as his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, here's what it says. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. If Jesus Christ himself had to overcome pride, if Jesus Christ himself had to rein in that sense of, of not needing anybody else, if Jesus Christ himself knew he needed God, how much more do we need God? How much more can we say that we probably do in some way struggle with pride? Luke 18, 9 through 14 says this, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other people. I thank you I'm not like robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. There's a guy putting on a show, isn't he? This guy's got a performance issue. Verse number 13 says, but the tax collector stood a distance. He would not look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me for I'm a sinner. I tell you this, this man who learned humility, who admitted his faults, who didn't raise himself up above others, this man went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do we sometimes miss the best part of what God is doing because of our pride? Do we sometimes miss the bigger picture of what God may be doing or wanting to do because we think the rules don't apply? We're just fine on our own. We're just out here doing flybys like Maverick. We think we got this. Well, five and a half years ago when, when my performance became known, when the reality of, when I could no longer put on a show, when the, the true me, the, the, the addict, the person who was living a lie, when that came to light, guess what? Man, my pride became a reality in two ways. Number one, I had to admit that part of my problem to begin with was a pride issue. I loved me. I loved to hear me talk. I loved me. And I was prideful, but not only that, when me came crashing down, when the idea of me went, came crashing down, when the greatest showman became nothing and he needed to ask for help, that same pride kept me from admitting my faults, kept me from wanting to get that help. I love Freedom Church. I love that God brought us here. I'm so thankful for it. But I spent the first year hiding in my pride. I spent the first year just not want anybody to know who I was or what I'd done. 
And, and, and certainly there were people within my circle who were helping me come out of that. Certainly Pastor Kyle and Kendall and some of the other people here knew that. But, but the pride in me was so ashamed of what I had done, so ashamed that, that now my pride was causing me to put on another performance. And the truth is, I think sometimes we're too prideful to ask for help and it causes us to miss what God wants to do in our lives. We're too prideful to say, we got a problem. We got a struggle. We got an issue. One of the things we do on Friday nights, Pastor Kendall mentioned I'm the recoveries pastor. We have, we have a group called I Am Free that meets on Friday nights. And, and, and one of the things that we do is, is we pride ourselves in not being prideful. We, we're just open and honest and say, we're all messed up. You know what though? In full transparency, we talk about you guys on Friday nights too. Because what we say about you is, they're all messed up too. They just hadn't made it over to Friday nights yet. You see, the problem with the face of Christianity or the, or the problem with Christianity is we're putting on the face of Christianity. I mean, we come to church, we're going back to performance here, but it's a pride issue too. We come to church, pretends everything's wrong, fight like cats and dogs on the way here, fight like cats and dogs on the way home, kick the cat and dog when we get home because everything's not perfect. That's why my wife and I drive separate cars to, to church. I don't want to fight on my way to church, especially if I got to preach. I, I'm in trouble. All right, I'm joking. But let's be honest. We put on a face. We put on a show. We're too prideful to say, I am hurting. I am broken. I am a sinner. I am messed up. I need Jesus. We become self-righteous. We've been doing this long enough. We know how to do it. We've been doing it long enough to be dangerous to ourselves. We've been doing it long enough to let pride enter in. Too much of a maverick spirit in many of our lives. Too much solitude, isolation. We need help. We need each other. The third thing I would thinking about with old Eutychus, old Eutie in the window. Make a good song, Eutie in the window. Mike Mitchell. Eutie in the window. I can see it now, Mike. The other problem that Eutychus might have had, I have to think, is maybe he wasn't putting on a show. Maybe he wasn't up in that window to be seen. Maybe he wasn't up there because he thought he was better than everybody else and he had a pride issue. Maybe Eutychus was genuinely up in that window because he was hurting. It wasn't about performance. It wasn't about pride. Maybe for Eutychus, it was about pain. Maybe for Eutychus, it was about his past. I can't help but think was Eutychus in that window because he didn't think he deserved to be anywhere else. He didn't think he deserved to be down there with the people. He didn't think he deserved to, to get in on what God was doing. Was his past or his pain keeping him from where he was supposed to be? Eutychus up in that window because he thought he deserved to be there. It reminds me of another great movie, one of the all-time great theatrical productions, one that will go down in the history of ages when everything is gone from humanity and gone from creation. The only thing left is faith, hope, and love and the Lion King. All right? The Lion King will withstand. It'll be number four. Love will be the last thing, faith, hope, and then the Lion King. What a great movie. What a great movie picture show. What a great experience. Wish I had a little baby lion cub to hold up here. Gosh, I love that movie. I'm watching Lion King tonight, y'all. If you haven't seen Lion King, it's an animated movie with one of the great James Earl Jones. I can't even get close. Don't even pretend. James Earl Jones. Anything he's in good, right? But in the Lion King movie, we all remember Simba made some mistakes. Simba caused some pain. And because of that, he experienced the pain. And because of something he did, he allowed it to keep him from being who he really was. He allowed his pain and his past to keep him from his destiny. I, not even that. If you remember, he allowed it to change who he really was. 
He runs off and hides and he's no longer a lion. He's out there with Timon and Pumbaa eating bugs. It had changed who he was. His pain was so powerful in his life that he had forgotten who he was. He wasn't the lion God created him to be. And he thought he didn't deserve the destiny of fulfilling the king's place. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says this, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forget what is past, strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here's what he's saying. Forget about the past. Move forward. Get over it. Romans 8 and 1 says this, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Simba needed to let go of the shame. He needed to let go of the regret. Isaiah 54, 4 says, do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. Here's what Isaiah is telling us today, that your past doesn't matter. What you experience doesn't matter. The the pain and the shame and the hurt doesn't matter because God's a healer. God moves us. God actually used that to help you become who you're supposed to be. Here's the best part of the movie of your life. You might have messed up. You might have cut out some scenes. Four years ago, I messed my movie up. Came to a crashing halt. And one of those things says, cut, 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 we're done. Movie's over, budget's spent. And I thought my story was done. And now I know that God used the worst parts of my story to make it the best story ever. But if I let the pain of my past keep me from seeing the bigger picture of what God's doing, if I let the pain of past, my past keep me from seeing what God is doing, I will miss the best parts. Sometimes we let our past keep us from becoming who we truly are. These are some of the reasons I think that many of us miss the big picture of what God is doing. We miss the best part. I mean, I think there's other reasons too. I certainly think there are other movies We could have went all night with this. I was thinking about Star Wars, you know, and Luke Skywalker running around with daddy issues all over the universe. And some of you got daddy issues, but the Bible tells us God's a father to the father. Let's just embrace who your father is tonight. Move past that. Not just, not just specific movies, but, but even types of movies. Like some of our, our spiritual journey is, like a horror film, if we're being honest. It's just scary. And the truth is we are terrified. We let fear paralyze us and we miss what God is doing. Some of us are more like a rom-com, like a romantic comedy. Some of us out there so busy looking for the one that we miss the one. And there's nothing romantic or funny about that. If our eyes aren't on the right one, we're going to miss all the right stuff. For some of you, it's not about movies at all. You know what it's about? It's about where you used to get movies. Blockbuster, that's right. Some of you have not got over the fact that there's no blockbuster. Listen, it is never coming back. Move on, people. Blockbuster's gone. Don't let that keep you from seeing what God is doing. Don't let things keep you. Don't let the way you think you want or the way you think it needs to be. Stop living in the past. As I close this message out tonight and ask the musicians to come, I I was really thinking about this movie idea and this theme of movies. And one of the things I find really interesting is the end of movies, right? Anybody ever watch the ending of movies? Like like the, the credits, You know, did anybody ever just watch the credit? I know we're usually just talking or finishing off our popcorn or whatnot. You ever paid attention to the credits? I mean, certainly it goes through who the actors are, the main people, the voices, James Earl Jones, you know. It certainly goes through all of that. But then there's some really funny things I notice in the credits, right? Maybe you picked up on some of these. I looked up the definitions of some things I didn't get about the credits. Like like in the credits, it'll say gaffer, right? And it'll tell you who the gaffer is. I don't even know what a gaffer is. Why does who it is matter? I looked up what a gaffer is. You know what a gaffer is in the movies? It's the head of the electrical department for a film production. 
Next time you're watching the movie and you watch the credits, you can give credit due to, to, to the gaffer because you know what he's doing now, right? How about the grip? Anybody ever saw those and wondered, what is a grip? What's a grip? A grip is a person or a member of the camera crew, camera crew responsible for building and maintaining all the equipment that supports the cameras. That's a grip. We got some grips at Freedom Tree. We got a grip right there. We the, what a grip! Credits tonight. How about a key grip? Now we know what a grip is. Anybody ever notice key grip in the credits? A key grip is, is the leader of all the other grips. The dolly grip. The grip. The camera grip. How about this one? Anybody ever saw in the credits the best boy? I thought that was the main character. I thought Simba was the best boy. The best boy in the credits is the second in command to the gaffer. Thankfully, you know what a gaffer is, or you wouldn't know what a best boy is. How about this one? You ever seen the Python Wrangler in a movie that didn't have pythons? A Python Wrangler is the person who pulls all the electrical cords around, keeps the cords running, the snakes. How about this one? The first assistant director. There's a first assistant director in the movies. Guess what else? There's a second assistant. Do you know what the second assistant does? He's the first assistant to the first assistant to the director. That means he does nothing. Why don't you just call him the coffee boy? So I was thinking about all these things in the back of the movies. You know, a lot of times it is the main character. It is the actors and actresses. It is the producers and the directors that get all the credit. It's not those people in the last, in the last part of the, the credits that get, that get the, 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 the fame. They don't get the, the notoriety. They don't get the praise. Because I'm thinking about that. The truth is, you know, it's the people at the bottom of the list that make the people at the top of the list famous. You know, those people at the top of the list couldn't do anything were it not for the people at the bottom of the list. Here's what I'm going to tell you tonight. There are, there are always going to be people on the stage. God has called and equipped people to do that. God has gifted people like Pastor LA and our musical team with incredible talents and, and great gifts. They'll always be showmen. And sometimes we can come and think, what is our part? What are we supposed to do? Here's what I want to encourage you tonight, because you are part of the big picture. I would say this, you are even the best part. So whatever it is that you do, if you're the second assistant to the key dolly grip, be the best second assistant to the key dolly grip there ever was. Whatsoever you do, do it as unto the Lord, because it matters. And when, when what you do matters, guess what? You get to see the the bigger picture. When you're a part of serving, when you're a part of building the kingdom, when you're a part of making Freedom Church and the, the Church of Christ across this world something incredible, guess what? You begin to see the best part of what God's doing. I want to close out with this because after the credits and after the main actors and after the dolly grip and the second and third assistants and after all the python wranglers, a lot of times there is what we call an after credit scene. Like not the real ending, right, Pastor? Sometimes there's a better ending than the one that left you hanging. Especially if we're talking about Marvel movies now. Listen, if you're going to watch an Avenger movie of any type, a hero movie, you better stay after the credits because there is an after credit scene coming. And here's the truth. Some of us miss the big picture in our lives. Some of us miss the best part in our lives because we walk out way too early on what God is doing. We get up and leave the seat. We're out of the auditorium. We're already gone. And we missed what God is doing. Anybody ever got in the car and realized there was an after credit scene and you missed it? Yeah, because you checked out too early. Be patient. Trust God. Wait upon the Lord. Here's the truth. The end of your story may not be the end of your story. Four years ago, I thought my story was over. The end. Roll the credits. I'm thankful today that there was more that God was doing. I'm thankful today that there was a bigger picture than what I could see then. I'm thankful today that the best part 
but still to come. Would you bow your heads with me this morning, this evening? I hadn't quite been preaching all night yet. As we close out the service, man, I'm so glad that you are here. I hope you experience Christ in our worship, Christ in His Word. I hope you enjoyed the popcorn. But more than anything, I hope you know this, that wherever you're at and whatever you're going through, God is up to something. God is writing your story. God is doing something. God is at work. There is a bigger picture than maybe you know or maybe you can see. And listen, I believe this is a show. I don't believe God does anything halfway. I believe it's spectacular. I believe the greatest showman there ever was is the Lord God himself. I believe that. I believe the best part is yet to come. But I don't want tonight our fakeness, our performance, our pridefulness, our pain, our past. I don't want that to keep us from what God is doing. I just want to simply do this as I close with prayer. If you're here and you say, hey, Pastor Kelly, the truth is, I need to see the bigger picture of what God is doing. I need to see the best part of my life. Maybe you'd say, I'm pretending. Maybe you'd say, I'm just putting on a show. Maybe you'd say, I'm prideful and I'm not willing to ask for help. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor Kelly, I'm just hurting. But tonight I want God to take all that. I want to admit my need for him.